Hey everybody, this is Sheets and welcome back to MMA. Uh, we've had about a month off, it seems like three months. Um, and we're gonna get started right away with uh, the January 14th card. And for those of you that watch these other videos, I'm gonna also do my best to um, give you guys some, uh, some tips on how to use the TrueDFS tools to build lineups and how to come up with a process of your own to build lineups. And I've been doing this for all the other sports. Um, and I might go back to the straight, you know, fight by fight breakdown or whatever it is, but we're going to see how that goes um, with respect to how to deliver content. Because again, for those of you that know me back from poker, I mean, I, I really want to make sure that I'm not just doing what everybody else does, unless I'm doing it extraordinarily better. Um, but in, in the absence of that, I want to at least provide a different kind of content to you guys because you're getting like picks everywhere. Um, I'd like to kind of, you know, to turn a coin a phrase, you know, teach you how to fish a little bit and at least, I don't know, to show you what good plays look like and to show you how to find good plays in the future and things like that. And not just, I know, just give me the picks for this week. But I think I found a way to just kind of blend the two of those concepts together and give you the picks for this week and yet still teach you how to, how to analyze subsequent weeks. So, um, one thing that's different about MMA, I think, than a lot of other sports is the way projections work. Um, one way that you can build lineups, for example, if you don't know anything about MMA is you could just take my projections or anybody's really, that I put up on TrueDFS, upload these into Saber, Sam, or an optimizer, and run an optimizer, and it'll spit out the lineup with the best, you know, the most fantasy points, pretty much, um, given the salary constraints. And that is one way that you can, you know, play MMA. It's very, very possible. Or you can just kind of do it by hand and just kind of rank all these plays by, I don't know, by points per dollar and just see which six guys you can kind of get in um, that are not fighting each other. So, I mean, if I did it that way, I would rate these guys by point per dollar. And I would see, I probably want uh, Argetta, Strickland. Here, I'll give you an example. Let's, let's, let's do that for you. Let's, um, let's pull up a, uh, a, a DraftKings lineup uh, here. And we'll pull up my projections. And my projections are pretty much, you know, aggregating other models and things like that across the industry. And I don't want to get into where this stuff comes from. But one thing to note is that this is, you know, these are median projections. Um, they're not ceiling projections. And quite honestly, none of these projections, if they came through, would be what you would want <laughs> out of your fighter to win a GPP. But um, seeing as that is the case for everybody, you could start with median projections to, to build kind of good lineups. And then the next step would be to know the fighters and their range of outcomes and be, to be able to figure out which, you know, whether two medians are not exactly the same. Like, is the Charles Johnson 77 the same as the Sijar Eubank 77? Or do the way these overall range of outcomes break down make one a better play than the other? That's a little more advanced, and we'll get into that. But for now, let's just presume that we're just trying to get the best median. And you could either just run this through an optimizer or you could just kind of look, you eyeball it and say, OK, um, rating these guys by either point per dollar or by sheets value score. And which are the cheapest guys that are near the top? Because those are the guys you kind of want to play. And whether you rank them by sheets value score or by point per dollar, you can see that Strickland and Ribeiro um, are probably the two best underdogs on the slate, okay? Um, we'll get into why that is as we go through the breakdowns, but remember, in DFS, you need to play underdogs to make your, you know, to make your lineups uh, fit the salary. So I think that you'd start by putting in Ribeiro here, and then we put in uh, Strickland. So when you put in Ribeiro and Strickland, you now have 8,600 left per fighter. And then what you try to do is see, you know, how many of these top guys you can get in. You know, uh, Ar Argueta looks to be the top point per dollar play, uh, along with Strickland by a decent amount. So you probably want to prioritize that. 
you put our get in over here. And now you're at 8,600 a man. So now you can, you can screw around, you know, you can, you can play, you know, if you wanted to get to say Rebecca, you could do that, but then you probably want to have to go to Damon Jackson or something like that, you know? So why don't we, why don't we try that? Let's put in, I don't know, Rebecca and then Damon Jackson. And then you have 8,600 left and uh, you can almost play, uh, you can play Soriano, like for example. Okay. So like this is probably a pretty decent lineup. You know, that, again, this doesn't take into account um, ownership or anything like that. So if you wanted to get a little bit fancier, you can go and see if any of these guys are particularly low owned. I will tell you now that the way life works is that, you know, if, 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 fighters or any DFS play looks like really strong value, then other people are seeing it too. And people are going to play the same guy. So let's just take a look at the ownerships. Of these guys that I just kind of put up here are 38% Strickland, 42% um, Ribeiro, uh, 35% Rebecca, 28% Jackson, 24. That's the lowest so far. And Soriano, 27. So you're you're not doing anything particularly uh, earth shattering by playing this lineup. And if you play this lineup, literally just like this, in, in a GPP, what's going to end up happening, and GPP means like those contests that pay like 100000 for first with $15 entry fees. If you play something like this, um, you're going to be, have the same lineup as, as many other, many other people. So what will happen is if in fact this does become the optimal lineup, which is hard enough as it is, you're going to be, you know, probably cashing for not a hundred thousand, but I don't know, six, something like that. I mean, this is this particular type of lineup is going to be duplicated by by a lot of people. But these are all really good plays, and if you're playing, say, single entry or something like that, maybe you could get away with playing something this chalky, um, chalky meaning, and the, the lineup that a lot of people are playing. Um, but what you probably want to do um, if you're playing GPPs is either take advantage of a pretty sick, you know, like an optimizer, like uh saber sim to kind of create high upside lineups for you that kind of fade ownership. But the other thing that you can do is kind of, kind of screw around this way. So let's look at these uh, lower owned fighters and see how much what kind of difference there is between this and some of these um higher owned fighters that projects kind of similarly like i don't know like barcelos cachuera i mean these guys these guys have 18 you know 18 percent ownership um but you'll see that you know the her projection for example is just significantly worse than strictly you know um so that's the thing. I mean, there's no kind of free lunch here. You know, if you were going to play someone that's lower on, you are going to get naturally, um, you know, a, a a worse a worse median projection. Um, but again, we're not really talking about median projection with respect to GDP. So if you define a median projection projected fighter that's got a big wide range of outcomes, and if things go your way you know, you're going to get a big ceiling. And that's the type of fighter you want to look for, especially at low ownership. Um, so again, we're going to go through these fights a little bit more analytically in a minute. But for, for now, I will tell you that like Priscilla Crash Cachuera, I mean, she at less ownership than say, I don't know, let's take Strickland, for example. I mean, it's possible that Cachuera scores more points than, than Strickland. Um, uh, is it is it likely? No, but it's possible. And if you're getting her at say one third or you know at least thirty percent of the ownership of uh, of Strickland, um, you know Cachuera in her range of outcomes, even though the median is forty five, there's a bunch of hundreds in there, you know, because she does have KO upside, and we're getting more into the styles of the fighters and things like that. But um, so maybe you would want to replace someone like Strickland with someone like Cachuera, you know, if, if that's the type of fighter that Cachuera is, which she actually is. Um, so these are the kind of things that you want to think about when you are, you know, just using these projections at least for GPPs. Is 
you can make a good a good lineup like this, for example. Um, and this one might be I don't I don't really play cash, but I imagine this is a probably a pretty will be a pretty common um, cash build. Um, but in the big hundred thousand for first GPPs, this is the type of lineup where it looks like so good, but it's kind of hard to explain. But you really just don't want to play this. Okay, you you have to make some concessions to gain ownership um, ownership leverage. Um, Okay, so I guess that's kind of like the first lesson is, is how to use these sheets to kind of build a single lineup like that. Um, but let's get into like the nuts and bolts of this a little bit, like why some of these guys are good plays. Um, and, and regardless of, well, we'll talk about the styles of the fighters when we get there, but a good place to start, again, if you're learning how to do this, is best fight odds. So what Best Buy Odds has is really most everything that you need, not most everything, but a good amount of what you need to at least understand where these projections are coming from and understand what good plays are. Um, because most of all, all you're looking for in, in MMA is whether a fighter is going to win and, and how often and in what fashion. Okay. Um, you know, it, so what are we looking at? We want fighters with good win odds. Great. We also want fighters which are who are going to hopefully knock the person out or finish them early in some way because you get more fantasy points for that. And in addition to that, you get a lot of fantasy points for both high volume, like a lot of significant strikes, and also for 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 takedowns and control time, which are conducive to the style of grapplers. So um what this will show you best fight odds are several of those components. We'll show you the, with the win odds. We'll go through that. And it will also show you the likelihood that that fighter finishes the other fighter inside the distance, which means that KO upside, that early finish upside. What this won't show you is the, the style. In other words, the, the best fighters are not going to show you who are the, um, the wrestlers and who are the grapplers. That is the stuff that you need to kind of know on your own or just kind of trust that, that the projections will bake into that. Um, and so as a result, let, let's go through it. So I want to kind of jump all over the board here. I want to show you what, what a couple of really good plays look like, right? And, and the first one, and this doesn't come up too often, so when it does, it's in, in, in such a violent way, we have to really identify this. And that is the fight between... Uh, Dan Argetta and Nick Aguirre. So what happens with the way DraftKings runs their, their business or whatever, they, they, they put their lineups, excuse me, their salaries out. And once the salaries get put out, they can't change those. So what happens is, is they build their salaries based on the matchup as they see it. And they factor in win odds and all that stuff that I just talked about. But then sometimes after those salaries are published, one of the fighters will drop out. So what then happens is, is that if the fight is canceled, then no blood, right? It's just, you know, you, nobody can play that fight. But if they, they replace the fighter, typically they'll replace the fighter with a worse one. Now, sometimes they'll replace it with a better one. And, and the, in either case, you'll have a situation where the salary is just not accurate anymore. So like, for example, um, Dan Argetta, he is 8,600. Now, an $8,600 fighter, let's find him. An $8,600 fighter is one that's usually about a dollar fifty favorite, like a three to two favorite or so. Um, if that, and that's what he was going to be in his fight against that of some Brazilian who was going to fight earlier. But they replaced him with Aguirre, and, and he is now on the money line a five to one favorite. So, what you have here is a fighter who is priced as if he were a dollar fifty favorite, who's actually a minus five hundred favorite. Um, so this, as as I like to say, this unfortunately is basically a mathematical lock. Okay, you literally have to play this if you are just about the math. Um, not to mention the fact that Argetta he has, he has a really strong inside the distance prop. He's minus one thirty or so, or minus one twenty or so to finish. So he's got a huge win win equity and huge and a really, really good inside the distance prop. 
and he's being priced as if he was a dollar, you know, a dollar fifty favorite. So this is what they call a mathematical theoretical lock. Um, do you have to play it? No, but you are you are really up against it if you don't play it. Now the problem is again is that everybody's going to play. But but one thing that I have noticed is that plays like this are not played, at least for my blood, as much as they should. I mean, I see guys like in this particular situation getting 45, 50% ownership. They really should be 80, in my opinion, at least. You know, this is the, this math is a tough, tough, tough road to, to overcome. Let's put it this way. It's a tough, it's a tough hurdle to overcome here. So, so all lineups, in my opinion. Uh, should probably start with Argetta. I mean, this is just the ultimate math play, and, and you just have to start with this. Um, so another one, uh, very similar, that happened was um, the main event. So the main event was originally uh, Imava versus Gastelum, and that was about um, what was it? What was I going to say? And Imavab was about a minus 180 favorite and was priced as such at 8,700. Um, the problem is, is that his opponent dropped out and they replaced him with Sean Strickland. Now, here was a case where they replaced him, Imavab's opponent, with someone better. Because if you look at the MMA odds here, you see Strickland is actually like almost a favorite. So it's actually let's just call it a pick 'em. Depends on kind of where you look here. Um, about a pick 'em. So the problem here is that now you have you have Imavov at eighty seven hundred. He's priced at minus as minus one eighty, but he is actually pick 'em. Okay. And on the other hand, the, where they messed up was that Strickland. They priced him at seventy seven hundred, which is basically like a plus one thirty underdog. Where he's actually pick them, so well shame on DraftKings for this one because they they could have made Strickland what he should have been. You know, it, it wasn't it looks they can't change him Bob, but they could have made Strickland eight thousand, but they didn't. Um, so what you have here is is this is like a little different because Strickland himself is a really really strong play. Why? Because again, he's being priced to pick them. And he is uh, as if he were pick him, and he's only eighty seven hundred. Excuse me, he's being priced as if he was plus one forty. He's pick him, so he has win equity. The other thing about this fight is that this fight is five rounds, so there, there's always inherent extra value in the five round fight because you have five rounds with which to work your volume, with which to work your fantasy points to to try to capture that KO or whatever. So. Um, Strickland is in a, a extraordinarily smash, extraordinary smash play. The other thing that's kind of interesting about this fight, though, is that Imavov is not like a terrible play. In other words, normally I would say Imavov at eighty seven hundred, but he's only pick him. There's negative win equity. However, they he still has that extra five round bump. So I don't think that Imavov is a terrible play. I think that he's kind of like a break even. So um, that's that's the deal. So I think that um, Strickland on the math, again, just kind of a theoretical lock, um, not as much as, as as Argetta, but I think with the five round bump, it's close. And then Imavov, I think, is kind of an OK play. Um, sorry, I just had to take that. Um, so those are two kind of classic type plays. Um, let's look at another one, which is uh, kind of a classic play. So what you're looking for in these fights are really strong, either really strong inside the distance props. Um, and uh, really strong inside the distance props and kind of decent win odds, right? So this fight here, uh, Abdul Rasak Hassan against uh, Claudio Ribeiro. So this is a perfect fight to illustrate. You have, let's see. Um, first of all, Hassan is 8,300, Ribeiro 7,900. So it's priced as though Al Hassan is, should be maybe not, I mean, maybe minus 120, something like that. Not much though. Minus 120 versus Ribeiro should be about a pick em or plus 100. 
first thing I'll notice is that actually Ribeiro is more of a favorite. So Ribeiro has has good win has a little bit of win equity here. But the most important thing is you look at the inside the distance prop. So you have both of these fighters. You have Ribeiro, who is basically a, a pick 'em to win by TKO. Um, actually, they both are. You have Ribeiro inside the distance about a pick 'em, and you have Al Hassan inside the distance is you know about a pick 'em. Um, so this is uh, this is a really really strong GPP play. Um, this is one of those situations where the 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 median projection is sort of meaningless, okay? Because you have both of these guys um, with a sixty median projection 160 157 yet neither of them are going to get that like ever you know not to say ever but there's a strong likelihood that the winner gets 100 and and the loser gets five you know what i mean there's very 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 little where the median is going to come into play so both of these fighters are extremely strong gpp plays they have extremely it's extremely likely that they finish and they're both very affordable. Now, as I mentioned, you have a little bit more win equity on Ribeiro. So that's why he, you know, probably rates to be slightly better. But the way variance works, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine separating these two in GPPs. As a matter of fact, like if, if people are going to run optimizers and get more Ribeiro because of, you know, everything I just said, and make Al Hassan a little bit a lower owned. I don't think there's a hell of a lot of difference, considering how volatile this fight is going to be between either of these guys. Um, I, I think that you can maybe make a case for Al Hassan to be the better play if he's going to be lower owned, and he will be, um, just because that variance is going to kind of catch up to it. It's going to catch up to that slight difference in the in the win equity. Um, so. Um, I, I will definitely say that, you know, if you're playing multiple lineups, that you want to have both sides of this. Um, and there's a couple of ways to handle that. I mean, you could either, you know, go 50-50. You, you listen, you could take whoever you like and, you know, play more of them. That's fine, too. But you definitely want to play both sides of this fight. And as you run lineups, you'll see what that extra 400 will actually do to you. Um, sometimes you're like, okay, I want to play the, the 8,300 fighter. What's the difference? But sometimes that 400 does make a big difference. It just depends on the rest of the contract, uh, con context of the slate. Like you're going to want to get our getting, you're going to probably want to get Strickland in. For example, maybe you won't, but whatever. Um, but that's the thing you have to think about. It's not so easy to say, oh, I'll just take both sides. If that extra 400 really makes it like difficult for you, then, uh, then, uh, maybe you, you can't play both sides. Um, without making some serious concessions. So those are the, the main, like, kind of, like, uh, teaching points. You know, there's not, there are not that many other fights that have that type of inside the distance prop with both fighters, for example. Um, and there are not that many fights that have that such a big swing in win odds. So those are the key fights of this card, is the Ribeiro al Hassan fight, the and the strickland Imaval fight, and... Um, and our getter. Now what we have to do is see where the rest of the lineup is going to come from. You know, wh which of the big favorites are those guys that are either strong inside the distance props or wrestling upside? Which of the underdogs have, have more upside than the others? And these are the guys that we want to look at. So right off the bat, all right, this is another fight which I want to talk about as I think is, is, a, is a key fight. And that would be Priscilla Cachoeira against uh, Sajara Eubanks. I alluded to her kind of in the intro, but Sajara Eubanks, excuse me, but Priscilla Cachoeira is very volatile. Like she, she doesn't have a lot of striking defense, but she just comes out wailing. And she can get first round KOs, she can get second round KOs. You know, there, there's, she has a, quite a bit of, of aggression and upside in that regard. Um, as a matter of fact, you look at her inside the distance prop here, despite her being a plus 220 underdog, you have Cachuera inside the distance is about, about plus 320 or so, which is not bad for that price. 
you know? Plus 320 for a fighter who is um, 7,400 is not terrible. I co well, we'll compare him. We'll pair her to some of the others in a minute. Um, so, but on the other hand, you have Sajara Eubanks, and, and she has incredible, well, incredible. She has really strong wrestling upside here. She has takedowns. And not only does she have takedowns, but Cachuera herself is very poor with her takedown defense. And when you have a, a kind of a combination of those two things, it's uh that's a tough thing to overcome here. So uh, I think that that this is another fight where you might be you know well served trying to play one of these two, you know, right, right, right off right out of the gate. Um, so let's just for example, we'll put Eubanks in, whatever it is. Um, I alluded to her a little bit before, but um, El Cachuera, but Cachuera, you guys, I think both of these fighters are really, really strong players. Um, now, uh, Charles Johnson against Jimmy Flick. Let's take a look at the odds here. Um, this is the second fight on the card. And so Charles Johnson is what, 99,000? Here's, here's one thing that you can kind of uh, use as a guideline. If you want to bet on a 9K fighter in DraftKings, 9K or higher, but let's just start with 9K, you really need one of two things, um, preferably both. You need an inside-the-distance prop, which is hopefully pick them or better. In other words, you need the market to be presuming that there's at least a 50-50 chance the fight finishes. And in the absence of that, you really want a fighter with, with a great deal of – uh, grappling, takedown, control time, upside. Now, as you get into the 9,400 range, you really kind of want to have both. You know, um, if you're getting up to 9,400, and we'll get to somebody like that in a minute, or 95, 9,600, you need either like even money to knock out the first round, right? Not just even money. You want even money, not even money to finish. You need even money to knock out the first round. Or at the very least, um, you know, an inside the distance prop of pick them and grappling ups, you know, um, and what usually comes with that is a really huge bit of win equity also. So we'll get to that. So we look at Charles Johnson here and at 9K, let's see what he looks like. We have Johnson inside the distance, which is minus 130, which is fine. This is, this is right there, exactly what you want. What you want. So, I think that Johnson is a perfectly good nine K fighter. Now, when you're looking at Jimmy Flick, okay, remember Jimmy Flick is 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 a three is a plus three hundred, right? All I'm trying to do now, I'm trying to compare apples to apples, and you have Cachuera and Flick who are basically the same price. Maybe Cachuera is two hundred higher. But you have Flick with with a significantly worse amount of win equity. Like he's probably about plus three hundred, where Cachuera is probably plus about two twenty. Um, the other thing, though, with Flick is it, it's possible that Flick has a good inside the distance prop. Let's see, but not really. So Flick inside the distance is like a plus. If you cut the vig in half, maybe plus five hundred. So this is a, a really, really poor underdog. So I would, um, if anything, I would play Charles Johnson. I think Charles Johnson, he, he fits the metrics pretty, pretty decently. And I, would, I don't think I would go for Jimmy Flick. Uh, Argetta and Aguirre, we kind of talked about Argetta. And unfortunately with Aguirre, I mean, you just can't bet plus 400, 500 guys. They're just not, they're never priced low enough. They should be priced about 5,000 and because DraftKings lacks dynamic pricing like that, they kind of undercap these guys. I mean, 7,300 is kind of a joke. You know, um, so Aguirre, listen, you can make one case. He's going to be 1% owned. Um, so if he does win, congratulations. But I mean, you just can't play him. All right, Nascimento Hernandez. You have another $9,100, $7,100 fight. So here's the thing about Nascimento. We look at the inside the distance prop here. The inside the distance prop is pretty poor. It's like plus 200. Um, however, he does have a certain amount of, of, of control time wrestling upside. It's not, uh, 
it's not the greatest, but it's okay. I do feel as though it's one of the weaker 9K fighters. The, the one thing about this, though, and this is just kind of knowing the styles of these fighters, is that Carlos Hernandez has a pretty decent get-up game. And, and while you might think, oh, that's going to be bad for Nascimento for control time, that could actually work in Nascimento's favor with respect to drafting scoring because the more times Hernandez gets up, then the more times he can get taken down. So it's like four, up, four, up, four, up. And while you don't get the same amount of control time, those extra takedowns are really big. Um, so I think Nascimento, uh, first of all, I don't expect Nascimento to be popular. So that is one thing. But I do think that, that he's one of the weaker of the 9K uh, fighters in the, you know, uh, absent the ownership consideration. Um, in 150 max, I would certainly have some, but in, in 20 max and below, I probably would. Right. Um, Nascimento, so Hernandez, let's take a look at him. So Hernandez, again, he's pretty much the same price as Cachuera, right? Um, actually, he's the same price as the other guy. He's always as, as no, actually 7,100, so he's lower. Let's see what his inside the distance prop is. First of all, he's plus 300. Again, plus 300 is rough business. But if he's maybe plus 400, maybe inside the distance, maybe I can take a shot. No, he's inside this like plus a thousand. I mean, this is really bad. So um, in addition to that, I don't see the the wrestling upside for him. Um, so to me, this again looks like a pretty poor underdog. All right, uh Jerry Basharat versus uh, uh Mateus Mendon Mendonca. 9200 versus 7k. Let's first take a look at the favorite have again 9200 what do we want we want either a huge amount of wrestling upside or an inside the distance prop of pick them or better or maybe both basharat inside the distance is a little bit poor you know he's plus 160 ish so in the absence of a uh, significant wrestling upside i would say that he's probably a worse player than charles johnson um, with respect to Men Mendonca, he doesn't have a great inside the distance prop. It's like plus 500, but he might have some wrestling upside, but at plus 300, that is just so rough. You know, that means that he's going to lose like 25, he's going to lose like 75% of the time. So what, what you are, when you bet on him in DFS, you're saying that. The 25% of the time he wins, he's going to be optimal or really close. And I mean, I guess, I guess it's okay. Um, I guess it's all right. So I would say that Mendonca is maybe a better underdog than Hernandez, maybe a, definitely better underdog than Aguirre, probably a better underdog than Flick. I still think Cachuera is a better underdog, but. I think Mendonca is probably okay. Uh, okay, uh, Rebecca versus Fiore. All right, so now we have a, a $9,400 fighter. So what do you do with this? So again, what are you looking for? You're looking for either or, but both. You want either an inside the distance prop that is great, basically even minor to finish in the first round, or um, an inside the distance prop at even with an incredible amount of takedown upside. and 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 wrestling upside, and and we do have that in Rebecca. First of all, he's minus 600, which is ridiculous. And then you have, by inside the distance, he's minus 200. I mean, that is big, you know? Um, that is really big. As a matter of fact, he's almost a pick him to win in round one, plus the wrestling upside. So this is the best play on this list. Um, and he's being owned as a result, but as, as a result of that, but nonetheless, he is the best kind of slate. Uh, Fiori, uh, plus 500, just not going to get there. We already talked about Ribeiro and Al Hassan. We already talked about Argetta's fight. Uh, Umar Nurmagomedov against Jaime, uh, Raoni Barcelos. So $9,300 fighter. So what do you need? You need again. 
inside the distance profit, probably either probably pick them to finish inside the first round or an inside the distance profit, even overall plus wrestling upside. I um, mean, he is a minus huge favorite minus 700. So he's got an incredible amount of win at win equity. Let's take a look at the numbers here. So you have Nurmagomedov inside the distance is kind of poor. You know, he's, he's plus 200. Boy, oh boy. I mean, this is, this is tough because, listen, he's got the wrestling upside. But you really, for 9,400, it's, it's, it's just a tough price tag to pay off. Um, unless you're getting just an insane amount of takedowns and control time. And Barcelos is not the worst, right? I mean, he's being priced as if he's just terrible, but he's been around the block. And I don't know. This, to me, look, it's probably a really good cash play because he's going to win 90% of the time pretty much. And he's probably going to score 90-ish most of the time. But is he going to get the 110 that you might need at 94? 100? Maybe. But I think he's a much worse play than somebody like, uh, than, uh, than Rubecki. So is he a better play than Charles Johnson? That, that is actually a good question. I, 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 I still kind of think that I will, I prefer the, I prefer the, uh, the strong inside the distance prop, maybe for Charles Johnson and the $400 savings, maybe not sure, but, uh, listen, he's a good play, but I don't think he's the best play on the stage. And Barcelos, he's, you know, just, you just can't bet guys plus 700 in DFS. Caitlin Vieira versus Raquel Pennington. All right, this is priced at Pick'em, and uh, it is a pick -em. So let's see if either of these ladies has a good inside the distance prop. I doubt it, and I would be correct to doubt it. You have Vieira inside the distance is a plus 500. Pennington inside the distance is like plus 750. Neither of them are that great. And wrestling upside, this fight is a complete pass. Um, Soriano versus uh, Roman Kapilov. Let's take a look at the prices. And forgive me, this is going longer than I expected, but I think this is worth it. Soriano, 8,500 to 7,700. So you expect Soriano to be about a minus 140, 150. And we, that's exactly what we have here. So there's no real win equity. Let's take a look at the inside the distance props. You have Soriano um, inside the distance is pretty, pretty fair at plus 150 or so for his price. Um, plus 150 at, at his price is about the same as about pick him at 9,100. So I think Soriano is, is a pretty reasonable play here. Not to mention the fact that it's somewhere deep in his skill set exists some takedown upside. So I think he's a pretty good play. Um, on the other side, you have Kapilov, and despite, well, I shouldn't say that. Kapilov inside the distance is plus 320. Um, he's plus 320 compared to Cachoeira, who is um, like plus 320 as well at a cheaper price. So I still think Cachoeira is the better underdog, but as far as his pure win odds, you know, Cachoeira is like only plus 200 where Copula is, you know, very reasonable, you know, plus 140 underdog. So he's going to win more often. The question is, is a win going to be good enough? Maybe, maybe not, <laughs> you know, um, so I think that he's fair in, in, in GPPs just to get more, you know, more combinations. Like if you don't get your win out of, say, Cachoeira or what's his name? Uh, we'll get to Damon Jackson in a minute. Uh, Cachoeira or one of the others. But I wouldn't expect much of a ceiling out of, out of Kapulov. But if you think that 77 or something like that can win you the slate, I think that he's pretty reasonable. Okay, uh, as I mentioned before, Damon Jackson against Dan Ige. Um, you have Ige, 8,400, 7,800. So you expect Ige to be about a minus 130-ish. I mean, it's minus 135. And that's pretty much what you have. Maybe a little tiny bit of win equity. 
for Damon Jackson, but not much. But let's take a look at the inside the distance props. You have Ige inside the distance is plus 500. Um, actually, that's not true. His inside this is plus 300. You have Jackson is a terrible inside the distance. and He's just coming off a big KO, too, at a plus 500. Wow. We'll talk about that in the, I guess, in the uh, betting breakdown. But nonetheless, from DFS, I mean, he just doesn't have the, the inside the distance prop to make this work. What he does have, though, is the wrestling upside. So he, he can get some takedowns on Ige, and that's certainly a part of his win condition. So um, I think Jackson is a pretty decent underdog here on this card. And Ige, boy... I think I think given the lack of other great inside the distance props, I think his at what's it, plus three hundred. I don't know. It just seems weak. I mean, maybe in GPPs and you're playing multiple multiple lineups, you'll get to some of him, but I don't think so. So you'll have um, you'll have uh, Damon Jackson as as another kind of a live underdog, but not because of the of the uh, of the uh, inside the distance prop, but more of the takedown upside. And we already talked about. Um, Imavov against Strickland. So um, what I want to do next is, and, and last, is I want to just do a sample build using Saberson just to kind of show you what kind of lineup Saberson would give us if we, um, we went in that direction. So I'm going to go straight to Saberson, but you can do this from TrueDFS. We'll upload my projections. And we're going to build 150 lineups. And use Saber Sims kind of proprietary sliders. And, and we'll see. Um, Um, so yeah, so you would have Argetas and, and Strickland, as I mentioned, the top highest own. And then, as I mentioned, Eubanks, strong play, Rebecca, Ribeiro, Johnson, Soriano, Ige, Hassan, Jackson, Kapilov, not getting that much Cachuera, which is interesting. Um, so when you run the Saberson build, you're probably getting pretty something close to what I was talking about here. But, but one thing that the Saberson lineup builder will give you is more is more kind of upside uh with respect to ownership than i would do by hand so you get like a couple of egays in there you know you'll get some copy logs in there you'll get you'll get a lot of guys in there um you'll get a jimmy flick in there just for funsies so to speak you know so uh yeah uh listen i hope that wasn't too much but i hope it was a good combination of showing you what good plays look like in general and then as applied to this week's card uh, next, uh, I guess later today or tomorrow, we're going to do a betting breakdown, which is a lot more fun. Um, and, uh, it'll be a lot more diff. It'll be much, it'll be much different with respect to outcomes. All right. That'll do it. Uh, good luck, everybody.